Welcome back, everyone, to the Writer's Parachute. We are guiding author and writer dreams to a perfect landing. We are back for season two, and today we have with us a very special guest. It is Laura Donnelly. She has written the book behind me, Joy on Demand, or a portion of. It is an anthology. It is Joy on Demand, Choose Healthy Habitual Happiness. And she uh, contributed the first chapter, which is Living with Joy. So we're going to be talking to her in just a moment. But of course, we always want you to smash that like button and go ahead and follow us here and subscribe on YouTube. We are on all podcast channels, so be sure to go pick out your favorite one. So again, we talked about this last week. We are devoting most of season two to talking about reviews. Reviews for authors and writers are king. They make or break. They are what get you in front of readers. When they go to buy a book, especially now online, which we're doing a lot of, people will read the reviews, even the bad reviews. I do it, you do it, we all do it. So reviews are important. We talked last week about asking for reviews, how to ask for reviews. So if you don't recall that one, go check out episode one of season two to check out how to ask for reviews. This week, we're going to talk about important reviews, specifically editorial reviews and paid reviews. Now, I'm going to caution you on paid reviews. There are many people who will offer you paid reviews do your homework. Check to see who their clients are, if they're happy, and what kind of reviews they're offering. I know it's really tempting in the beginning because you don't have reviews to go grab those paid review services and get those paid reviews, but I caution you against that because a lot of times what you'll get is 10 reviews that pretty much say the same thing, and it's very obvious when they go up on your website or up on your Amazon page or up on your Goodreads or wherever they end up, it's going to be very obvious that they are 10 reviews by the same person using different names. So be cautious of that. Do your homework, check them out, make sure they're credible, make sure that they're meeting their customer and client needs because you are paying them for a service. Make sure you're getting what you need. Now, then there's editorial reviews. Of course, the top of the ladder is going to be Kirkus Reviews. Second, below that, just slightly, is probably going to be Publisher Weekly Reviews. Don't worry if you're self-published. They have the Book Life that does uh, reviews of uh, self-published authors. So you have that opportunity. And then there are many, many others below that. Some of them are very genre-specific. So... If you're a children's author, go look for those reviewers who speci- who specialize in children's books. One that comes to mind would be Story Monsters uh, and their Dragonfly Awards. And if you are in another genre, go check out what's available. If you don't know, check through the uh, independent associations that you might belong to for your specific genre. They're going to get, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is not doing well today. Um, they will give you a list of awards and reviewers that they credit and they have vetted for you. So do take that advice. These reviews typically will go up in the editorial section or editorial review section of your Amazon page. If they don't, then you might want to check back with them and see why they did it. So Those are my recommendations for editorial and paid reviews. As always, we'll be adding more information, and this is just a taste of that topic. If you want more, come back next week, and we'll continue talking about reviews and how they're king to authors and writers. So we want to get on with our show and talk with Laura. So Laura, as I said, has been a contributor to this book behind me, Joy on Demand, Choose Healthy Habitual Happiness. She is a teacher, mentor, choreographer, dancer, writer, business coach, and founder of Dancing with Ease. She teaches body, brain, bounce online and in person. The work is based on Laura's 35 plus years as a performer and as a teacher of the Alexander Technique, Movement Fundamentals, 
uh, semantics and business management. She is multi-talented, successful, sensitive to people that hire her and teach her to reduce, teach them to reduce stress, move out of pain, and um, eliminate the overwhelm. Donnelly's work allows people to apply the principles of right effort and balance to interpret relationships, business creation, and development, public speaking, or writing. The body brain balance method is based on personal well being and emphasizes organic growth through awareness and choice clients experience success and joy welcome to the writer's parachute laura how are you today i'm fine and thank you so much for uh, having me as a guest i'm really excited to be here and um and i learned something about reviews <laughs> well, it was great <laughs> well that's what we're here for we're trying to share the wealth and spread some of the information and knowledge that we have well you know, giving people a taste of books they may not know about and authors they may not know about. So I want to know why joy in all the things that you do, why was that the topic for you to write this book? Let's see. I, th I think that it's the kind of the underlying theme in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, long, long ago, I found the Shaker song, Tis a Gift to be Simple, Tis a Gift to be Free. Uh, then it goes on, Tis a Gift to Come Down Where You Ought to Be. And I've had really wonderful experiences in my life where it, it just kind of is there. I feel like, oh, I, I'm in the right place right now. This was exactly where I was supposed to be. And the feeling is is one of, real joy, not, you know, giddy happiness, not the squeaky, squealy thing that little kids have or or that people encourage little girls to do or uh, or that thing like going over, uh, okay, come on, Laura, roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And that that's scared, happy, you know, you get to the bottom, I'm still alive, thank heavens. This is, this is more for me uh, the feeling of sort of like a bubbling, bubbling joy, just going around inside all the time, even on a bad day. I can look out the window and see a bird or see my crabapple tree blooming. And in that moment, oh, right, that brings me joy. It doesn't change anything else, mm -hmm. but it's just an awareness that in and among every, all the things that happen to us all, all the time, joy is possible. Well, and after reading the book, I kind of agree with you. I kind of got from it that, you know, joyous is that feeling of immediate joy. But what you're speaking about is that warm blanket that's letting us know deep in our soul that we're happy. And that's the kind of joy that you're talking about. And I love that. I was just like, wow, never really kind of separated the two in, you know, from that instantaneous moment to that, you know, there's just that warm blanket that wraps me in happiness. And that, that was very cool to read and to kind of see the progression that you made through the story. So I want to know, you know, you said this is anthology and there's several authors here. So we, we get this question a lot here on the Writer's Parachute. How did you connect with these other writers and to this project? Let me think. Okay, the, it's a little bit circuitous and it involves relationships, which is another area in my life that brings me a lot of joy, knowing people, meeting people, sharing things with other people. So a friend of mine, uh, Christine Goad, had participated in an anthology the year before. And so I met the woman who organized the anthology through my friend, Christine. And then she, she was putting together another book. She does the editing, the cover design. She does, in my opinion, all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and she was gonna put together another book and uh, she, she and I talked and she asked me if I wanted to participate. And I thought that it was a very good step for me. I, I write a lot, I write, 
blog articles and I write journals and I I write letters. I I have one former teacher from my sixth grade. She's my sixth grade teacher. We've been writing now for mm, it might be 50 years. <laughs> We've been writing <laughs> letters to each other. And these are, you know, this is a, a way of communicating. And so I I wanted to write, but I really didn't want to write a whole book. I, I wasn't, um, I do a lot of different things and I just didn't feel like I had the time or the energy to focus on a whole book. So she said that she had been talking to people and she had a few people that were working in this idea of joy and and changing patterns, changing life patterns so that they that people could choose, mm-hmm. you know, to be happier to think differently so that they were able to return to that place of you know quiet uh you said you said it's like a warm blanket Mm -hmm. and uh and for me it's like a a nice pot of something really good stewing on the stove not really bubbling not boiling just Mm -hmm. just right there and so so I said okay and and we had a meeting and and we liked each other the authors you know we we each had a different point of view mm-hmm. like coming from a different spoke on the wheel but it was uh enough in alignment that it felt like it would make a cohesive book for somebody you know somebody looking to change habits to be healthier right <clears throat> and you guys did an amazing job and i don't think it probably would not have had the impact and the punch that I got from the book without you setting up that first chapter, because that kind of, you know, is again, you know, I I felt like the warm blanket, warm bath. It was just kind of like all that preparation that you needed to get into that mindset to really think about joy and happiness and how we affect the way that we perceive it and we demonstrate it not only to ourselves, but to others. And I really kind that, you know, I found that very fascinating and helpful. You know, I, I tend to be very empathetic and, uh, you know, and take on a lot of other people's emotions and it's a lot of weight to carry around. So trust me, I'm going to be using some of your tips in the book to try and stop that because it does get overwhelming. And as you said, it's hard to sort out which which you and what's people around you so it is and and you know and growing up I had a lot of people just say to me like well well you've got you're wearing your heart on your sleeve you you know you know you need to not be so sensitive you need to not be so caring and I was always looking for a way to me that sounded like I had to shut off Mm -hmm. aspects of myself that were really important to me and so I was really looking for a way to understand, understand myself, you mm-hmm. know, first, but then also understand how to help people authentically, not do things for them, mm-hmm. but to, well, what I have discovered is, is that if I can stay present, then they, they get, they're encouraged to come into presence also. And then they learn to take care of themselves. And it's it's something that they can do time and again, not just when I'm there to offer a helping hand. Right. And, and it's, it's very difficult sometimes, you know, when we have this, this kind of uh, continued mindset where, you know, we forget because we feel that, that need being pulled from other people and, and it's almost instinctual to want to fill that need. And you have to, you have to resist because if not, you know, it becomes very overwhelming. And uh, I, like I said, I'm very thankful that you came here to the writer's parachute. I was able to read the book and I'm going to put some of those things into practice. So I want to know what you think that readers, other readers should gain from your book, Join the Man, Choose Healthy Habitual Happiness. I think that uh, they can discover, well, they have five options to find Mm -hmm. a pathway for themselves to look at their life and their thinking and how they deal with the world 
through these five different examples and ways of interacting in the world and the the sections of the book a lot of times include the author's journey how what they realized in their life mm -hmm. and i think that 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 kind of writing usually gives me encouragement mm -hmm. you know this person figured it out i can figure it out mm -hmm. the way you figure it out for you is not going to be exactly how i figured it out for me right. and it's not going to be exactly how the next person who reads the book figures it out but this idea that um there's a way through this thing that I'm going through, whether it's uh, personal personal stress with job or a caregiving situation, which can be really stressful and 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 feel unhappy, and it can feel unhappy all the time. And so then this idea that oh, what about right now? Like I took care of my mom for for six months at the end of her life, and she loved to have bacon for breakfast and so every day we made bacon because it didn't matter she didn't have to worry about her weight or anything anymore and every day she would say I love bacon <laughs> and it was a moment of happiness mm -hmm. and what I learned was to to value those whenever they happen mm -hmm. and not skip over them because this is still going on you know Oh, one day I was whistling while I unloaded the dishwasher and my brother's like, I think I was whistling Fiddler on the Roof. And he's like, how can you be happy? <laughs> and I said, right now, right now, what's wrong? This instant, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, right now, nothing. I said, okay, what's right right now? And he said, well, the sun is shining. We have flowers on the table, you know. We're about to have breakfast. I said, there we go. That's how I can be happy right now. Because I stay right now. Yes. And and he was kind of like, but I'm a guy. I'm supposed to solve problems. I said, does that make you happy? <laughs> and so it's ideas too. We carry ideas. And I think this book shares with people ways to change your ideas, ways to look at your ideas. Are mm -hmm. these ideas helping me or not helping me? And a lot of times we can identify ideas that don't help us, but we aren't always knowing the next steps to unravel that idea. And so I, th I think that the book offers some, some good pathways for doing right. that. Right. And, and I would absolutely agree. And of course you do. The secret to writing a good book is good storytelling. And, you know, especially with self-help books, I always find them much more helpful if the person talking about it experienced it, <laughs> you know, because then I feel that camaraderie. I feel like we're having a personal conversation about something that we've gone through because she, and it can be a little more private, even though it's a book, it's out in the world, but it can be a more private moment for the reader. And, and I do appreciate that through this book that you guys are diving pretty deep into some sort of painful and, and common situations that, you know, but they do make the, the ideas and the concept really come alive and pop off of the page, which I really did appreciate. So I want to know if you could go back to the beginning before you started writing this book, before you decided to join for this anthology, what do you wish somebody had told you or that you already knew? I think, and this is hard to know if it's possible, mm -hmm. but I wish that somebody as I wrote the book, actually, the chapter, I, I started to have the idea and the feeling that many people in my family were very sensitive and caring and kind. And that when they would tell me to toughen up, they were trying to protect me from the things that had happened to them from being too open, too caring, too kind. Mm -hmm. And so I know that they did that with love, but what I what I wish is that somebody had known how to deal with this kind of energy mm -hmm. and been able to uh, teach me a little bit early on mm -hmm. in my life 
how to develop healthy boundaries. A, a lot of my chapter is about how to, to develop healthy boundaries and what is a healthy boundary? Because um, I, you know, I thought, well, okay, I can't do this, but I, and it was like walls. It was like blocking me in and cutting me off from really important information. You know, like when you walk into a room, I don't, I don't know how you are, but like if I walk into a room, it's kind of like a, whoosh, I get a <laughs> kind of a whoosh of stuff. And, and it's very valuable to me because it, it lets me know, is this a room full of people who are happy? Is this a room full of people who are exhausted at the end of their day, but they had to come to this cocktail party. And so they're drinking some drinks to just get through. Well, okay. That lets me know. I'm not going to make a lot of great contacts. I might get some people's names and I might know who to follow up with, but this is not an energy mm -hmm. for building. This is an energy for just getting through this thing. And I learned all that through trial and error, lots of trial, lots of error. And as I, as I work with parents of young children and they're and they're like ah, and I'm like yes I see that you're upset but your kid is upset and your kid reads you I said so the first thing you know after you say well they're not wet they're not hungry they didn't you know step on attack we we solved all those but they're upset come back to yourself you know, and that's what nobody really told me that I was really outwardly focused and I was trying to help people and fix things. And, and nobody said, just bring it back to yourself a minute, mm -hmm. just settle in yourself. And then you will know exactly what to do. That would have helped me a lot. <laughs> right. Well, and you know, for me, I know exactly what you're talking about when you walk into a room. So uh, what I have learned is that I will meet somebody outside and as we walk in, we're having a conversation. So it keeps my focus on that instead of, you know, what's happening in the room. And that way I can sort of ease into it. But I do know what you're talking about. It suddenly, you know, it, it suddenly changes your, not only your outlook, but your own attitude, which starts getting radiated out to the people around you. And if there's another sensitive person in the room, you just immediately change their attitude. <laughs> so yeah, it, it it's really difficult. And, you know, I, I do try to tell people that, you know, mistakes are learning moments, you know, and we shouldn't discount them and we shouldn't say they're bad because they're really not. I mean, I, don't know that I learn anything from being perfect. I learn so much more from when I mess up, from when I do it absolutely the the worst way possible. So you know there there is some of that we, you know, and you know the society today I think is going really fast, and we expect everybody to just pick up everything quickly and run, and that doesn't always happen. But you know what I find is all the innovative things happen because somebody messed up <laughs> so uh you know and I try to remember that and I try to remember that you know when when one of my grandkids are are you know having a hard time and they're struggling and try to you know not feel that impatient and just let them work through it because I can't I can't well I mean I can feel it but I can't live the pain or whatever it is for them, I have to let them do it themselves. And it's hard. It's hard. And, and that <laughs> is hard. That is very hard. And it's very hard for empathetic people to do. <laughs> and I I liken it to, to a toddler learning to walk. It, you know, if you always hold them, you know, they, they are never going to learn where their balance is. <laughs> and if you always rush and grab them before they can fall on the ground, they also don't learn that they can fall and get back up. Right. And so, like you said, it, it's it's hard, but what I do now when I, when I watch somebody that I care about who's struggling with something, is I do this, this thing where I come back to myself first. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said about being in a room and what you radiate out. If I radiate out, radiate out a, a sense of calm, and being at ease in myself, even though they're upset, mm -hmm. their upset actually decreases a little bit 
Whereas if they're upset and I join them and they're upset and we have to fix this, we have to, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is a problem. This right. makes their problem worse, actually. Right. Makes them feel worse, which mm -hmm. is the opposite of my desire to help. Mm -hmm. right. And so this idea that by, by coming back to myself and taking care of myself in the moment that I create space, like it sounds like you're doing for your grandchildren, for them to learn from their experiences. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you uh, give them the keys when they're drunk at a party and send them out into the car. No, that's not. That's not what I mean about, that's a powerful lesson, but let's, let's avoid that one if we mm -hmm. can. Uh, but it, but it means like these internal struggles and these, you know, um, I'm never going to have a boyfriend thing that, that comes up for girls at a certain age, or um, my, my best friend doesn't like me anymore. You know, mm -hmm. it's okay. Do you like yourself? Mm -hmm. If you don't like yourself, do you have compassion for yourself? If you need to change something, changing from a place of compassion and self-love is very different than changing from a place of, I hate this about myself. You know, I, I have to, it's very hard to change from that place. It is. And, and I will tell you that, you know, we are so much harsher on ourselves than we are on anybody else in the world. In fact, if anybody had said the same thing we said to ourselves about anybody else, we would be the first in line to yell at them and say, that's not nice. That's not oh, correct. Me. That's not true, but we don't intercede on our own behalf. And, and I think sometimes that leads us down a path of not real reflection of who we are and what we are and what we do. We tend to you know, accept all the negative and push away all the positive, you know, it, it, and I, I find it amazing to me, even at the age I am now, when somebody compliments me, I'm always suspicious. But when somebody criticizes me, I take it truly to heart, <laughs> you know, which is hard because you think about it, they should have equal billing and we don't often give them equal billing. And I, I think that this is kind of what you're talking about. It's like you have to be true to who you are. You have to see yourself truly to be true to yourself. And uh, and and that sometimes requires shutting up the critic in your head. I personally have named mine George. He gets locked in the closet when I get annoyed with him because he he's very critical of my writing and I can't deal with that. So. But, you know, it's whatever you need to do to get to that point where you can accept who you are. And I think it's just amazing. And you just added more tools to that toolbox in trying to, to find that sort of self-love and self-balance and less recrimination, I think. Well, and this, what you just said is so important is, is to realize each person must realize for themselves when they give more credit to a critical statement than to a positive statement. Mm -hmm. Now, I started out in dance, which is <laughs> which is an interesting field. Yes. <laughs> but one of the things that they have is, is corrections. You get corrections in dance class, which really means you did something wrong and they tell you how to fix it. But the more corrections you get, the more attention you get and the more it means that the teacher sees value and potential in what you're doing and um and they almost never tell you in dance class that you did a good job no and you know and so so then i pick a field where this is reinforced and i pick a field that is all about perfectionism mm -hmm. in terms of, of classical ballet and uh, i was oh wow so, so this is interesting to me how I built up through my certain experiences, these things that I kind of started with as, as ideas in, in my family and, you know, and, uh, but to look at that and to say, oh, when I teach, can I, can I give as many recognitions of what somebody did well? Mm -hmm. as a request for that they change something so mm -hmm. that I I changed my teaching style mm -hmm. quite a bit but it was hard and first I had to realize it because in the beginning I didn't even realize that I 
that I blew off compliments and I beat myself up for things that people said could be better, could be different, should be different, ought to be different, whatever. And so that that realization in your own thinking and your own internal valuing, that's the first step in making a change. It, it absolutely is. And it's like, I, I always say the coulda, woulda, shouldas will get you. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. All right. So I want to know, what do you think readers will think of this book in 10 or 20 years from now? Well, I thought that was a really interesting question. I I really liked it. And what I was realized is that I hope that the need, need for how to deal with boundaries and how to deal with paying more attention to joy in your life becomes uh, not necessary because more people do it and then more people teach it to um, to their kids and to their students and to whoever they work with so that this idea and, and most of the, the fundamental idea is that how you think about things really is important in terms of what happens. So, so same thing. Am I looking for what's wrong? Am I looking for what's right? So like, like in my teaching dancing, if I, if I look at the whole classroom and they all ended on the correct count, but not necessarily on the right foot, I can say, great, great musicality. Now let's check. Did we all end on the right foot with the left foot pointed back? If not, just change it. There you go. Just change it. Everything's good. So the ability to change from a place of, mm, what do I want to call this? Is that weird? Like mm-hmm. a nice place of happiness. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I think what you're doing is you're you're taking this the the very strict guide rails and making them a little softer, a little less rigid, and you know, creating those boundaries that can kind of wave and conform to the individual person, which is great because that's what we need. Because yeah. not everything works perfectly for each person sometimes we have to figure out our own little caveats our own little way to do things it's like we talk about this this thing my mother is left-handed now most people my cat's going to come join us (laughs) um you know most people don't think too much about having a mother who's left-handed but she taught me to tie my shoes and if you think about how you learn to tie your shoes, you're watching somebody do it. So you're almost doing it backwards anyway, but her being left-handed, it's upside down and backwards. So when I tie my shoes, it's like, people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm tying my shoes, but it works for me, you know? And that's kind of where we have to um, be comfortable with it and find out what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And then to have the courage to, to stick with that, you know, when, when people say, well, well, you, what are you doing? Well, I'm tying my shoes. Well, why are you doing it that way? Because I like to do it that way. It reminds me of my mother, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's whatever. And so the, um, so I would, I would like, I would like for people to understand boundaries better and to understand how to maintain their own boundaries better. And so that in 20 years, that people would look back and maybe look at this book and go, really? They were talking about that? What was wrong with them? I love it. You're the first author I've ever had here that's hoping her book becomes obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great, I mean, that's a great um, want and need and goal in the future. So I love it. So I want to know what kind of writing or publishing challenges that you guys ran into writing and publishing this book. I, I personally, I struggled with, uh, it felt like it, it was, uh, see, even talking about it, I startled. Do you love that? It has five themes. Like each, it, each theme contributes to the overall theme of joy mm-hmm. and choosing joy and learning the skills to choose joy, even in difficult times. But then it's it's like uh, 
well, we we had a we had a, well, we're supposed to find writer readers to read early readers, right, to, and to ask them to do reviews, mm -hmm. and and so the people who liked me wanted to just read my chapter and re review my chapter, and the people who liked Robin wanted to read her chapter and and review her chapter, and it was hard to get people to read the whole book. Right. We ha we each one had a little loyal fan base who was looking at our chapter, mm -hmm. and. And just because somebody's my friend, this does not mean that somebody else's chapter wouldn't speak to them more directly. And, you know, you can't tell people, well, you have to read the whole book. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> seriously, you're doing me a favor, <laughs> you know. And so it, it was, and I didn't want to say, you know, read this book because my essay is in it. That seems like, you know, like, Mm -hmm. too much you know too much self-promotion whereas if it was only my book it's like well okay well then read this book it's my book read it my you know you're my friend you're my sister you're my cousin whatever you you have to read it no but this was more like I'm happy to be part of this book I hope you like the whole thing you know mm -hmm. and and I hope that you uh click the links in my chapter and come have a conversation with me afterwards Mm -hmm. And and so then it was it was like am I promoting the book am I promoting my chapter am I promoting all the other authors mm -hmm. and it was just challenging for me. Right. It sounds like you guys are having a cohesive problem here. Is making it a cohesive message that is appealing to uh, all your different audiences. And what I would suggest, just as a writing coach, is maybe when you're sending out to beta readers before it's published, take down all the individual author names so they oh. don't know who wrote what. Right, right. That's a great idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Strip it, strip it down so they're not aware of that it's not one continuous author or it's not a co- co-author throughout the book so um yeah and i would just generally say that if, if you know if you're co-authoring or you have a compilation or anytime you're working on an anthology or something if you're wanting those pre-reviews and those uh you know beta readers and stuff like that i would strongly su suggest stripping it down before you send it to them because you will run into that a bit but if they aren't aware and they can't who, who's tell. Who's which, yeah, right. and they can't tell. Then they'll more likely read the whole thing. <laughs> so, no, that's good. That's really good. Well, glad I'm glad I could help you with that one. So, what advice do you think that you would give other authors and writers about doing a book or an anthology? Okay, I think an anthology is good if you are not ready to write a whole book. I think it's a good step in into the whole publishing realm mm -hmm. into completing something you know all the way completing it having somebody an outside reader read it and send you back editorial notes ask for clarification in certain spots because no matter how many times you edit it yourself mm -hmm. you're you know what you mean <laughs> exactly <laughs> And so if something isn't quite clear, you skip over that. And and a couple of times the editor wrote back to me and, and you're like, she's like, well, you're using this phrase. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's not really jargon, but it is a phrase specific to my work. Therefore I need to explain it the first time I use it so that this makes sense throughout the rest of the chapter. I said, like, oh yeah, that's helpful, mm -hmm. okay, helpful, mm -hmm. which, which, five seven years I've been writing about this it's it's pretty far buried in my mm -hmm. understanding of of what I'm doing the other thing oh my heavens all the technical stuff all the technical stuff by participating in this project uh the coordinating editor did the keywords can I just tell you the keywords make my stomach turn upside down <laughs> So she went to find keywords for helping to promote the book. She found an artist to do the cover. She um, handled all the editing, all the layout, all the print, all the Kindle direct publishing. 
I mean, all the parts that kept me from writing, actually, from, from publishing mm -hmm. a book, all those parts. Mm -hmm. She did all that stuff. And I was like, wow. So, wow. So, so I could really focus on what I wanted to say mm -hmm. and getting that as clear as possible. Also, she provided um, co-working sessions mm -hmm. for a lot of the authors so that people got together to keep themselves writing on track. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of a lone wolf. <laughs> so that I didn't really need that so much, but I did show up a couple of times just to make sure that I was mm, on schedule, in flow. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. That was the other thing. She had a schedule. I need this by this date so that we can publish by that date. If I was doing it by myself, I probably would have rolled all that, you know, oh, well, I'm not quite done with this. So we're just going to roll that back a little further. I probably would still be working on it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, those things are really very important. I mean, whether you're writing alone or whether you're writing in a group um, or writing an anthology in, in co um cohesion together is like you know as an author number one writing is a very lonely solitary practice so anytime you can get together with other authors to write not necessarily that you're all writing about the same thing but you feel that camaraderie you feel that motivation a little bit deeper it gives you that that little bit of push to to get going to keep staying with it even when it's frustrating or aggravating um so that's always good you know and scheduling is you know I tell people, if you're going to write a book, you've got to open up your schedule and make appointments in your day to, you know, or in your week to, to write, because otherwise you're not going to get it done. Now, it doesn't have to be a big time commitment. It could be, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to four hours a day or more, depending on what your schedule and needs and deadlines are, but you need to do that. And, you know, some of this technical stuff, there's always help. So, you know, it, it's, it's not, I, I know this scares a lot of new authors and first time authors they are just like, I just want to write books and it's great. And I applaud that, but I'm also a teacher and I will never get rid of my teacher's heart. <laughs> and so it's not as hard as you think it is. It's just going through it the first time and, and you have to give yourself grace for that learning curve that everybody's going to experience. And I still experience it, you know, with every new book that I, that I work on or that I help somebody with, there's always something new to learn every single time. So it's not like even the professionals know every little step. So it's just trusting the process. <laughs> well, and even if you learn it, they, they probably change the software. Yes. You know? And that's an, that's another piece of learning, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, so. Yeah. But I, I, I actually go back to my perfection and mistake thing. It's like, I, I don't worry too much about it because I figure if I make a mistake, well, the, the program's going to tell me pretty quickly and, you know, because I'm going to learn more things that way to help the people that I help than if I did it just perfect every single time. So I, I prefer to look at as the, you know, is learning more each time I, I step off and just trust that I'm going to end up somewhere I need to be. <laughs> that sounds good. Sounds All like right. Good. So I want to know what keeps you motivated. I think it's joy, <laughs> you know, and, and, Making things makes me happy and joyful. Uh, helping people. And I, I did think that, that, you know, I can reach so many people one-to-one, -one, but I did think that through a book that the ideas would go out into the world further mm -hmm. than I could, uh, you know, toss my little ball. <laughs> well, and that is true. I mean, that is one of the nice things is that, your book can be available to anybody, anywhere. 
that wants to read it or needs to read it or needs to hear about it, which is, you know, why we try to do what we do is, again, let other people know about books and authors they may otherwise not know about. So we're glad you're here with us today. So I want to know what's next for you. Well, I I have a, um, a podcast that I've been doing for about two years called The Healing Path. And I just interview people working in all different kinds of modalities. And I've been having this idea percolate in my mind that I could uh, take groups of of the interviews and and Mm -hmm. turn those into a series of books Mm -hmm. that would uh, focus around the 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 modalities people bring are just so widespread that it's really fantastic, you know, from dreaming to yoga, to uh, physical movement, to chiropractic, to just all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And and the purpose of the podcast is to just open the door for people to discover different kinds of modalities. And, and it is basically storytelling with the uh, guests, conversation and, and stories about how they got into the modality they got into. Why did that help them with the direction they went? And so, but they fall into categories like body category or mind category or, uh, and so I thought that I could, I could pull those together. <sighs> See, I'm a little breathless. <laughs> I think that it's an idea that has real potential, mm-hmm. but I just haven't done it yet. <laughs> haven't, I haven't even, I haven't even gone through the whole set of interviews to start to say, oh, these five would fit together really nicely or these 10 would fit together nicely. Mm-hmm. And what I'm thinking is that that although it would focus on different people and different topics, if if I wrote the whole book, then it would have a little bit of a different kind of cohesion in terms of, uh, it's funny, I, I have another book, uh, Teaching with Joy, <laughs> that mm-hmm. I have an essay in. And it was a more of an academic book and the and the editor's, really did a kind of um container Mm -hmm. for the book you know they did a something in the beginning and something in the end of the book but then they divided into sections and again they wrote something at the beginning of the section and something at the end of the section that held the different authors concepts together Mm -hmm. in a really lovely way and so i i think that that's a part of the model Mm -hmm. i would be thinking about Right. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to warn you because this, this kind of thing does tend to lead to lead to a little bit of overwhelm as I'm sure you're experiencing a little bit because it is a big concept. So um, what I would say is maybe look at it from a different point of view, maybe look at it as what you think would be helpful to the reader and what would go together and make sense to the reader rather than you because they're the ones learning from this information rather than understanding it in a kind of a cohesive manner so uh, that would be kind of my advice on that so we want to know where listeners can find your books uh it's on amazon and um you can look for joy on demand and then look for the pink one with the hummingbird on the top because okay. there's a few books called joy on demand right and and just to let you know if you're in the audience we will add all the links that we're going to mention here in just a few minutes to the show notes for you so you don't really need to write them down but we will have them for you we'll have a link to uh laura's book we'll have a link to other things for you but before we get on to that i want you to write a review for your book Oh, I did that and I wrote it down. So I was going to pull it back out because I All right. worked really hard on it. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't work too hard on it, but um but I did I did think about what I what I would say if I had read it uh, to review it. And mm-hmm. that was a really good question too, to <laughs> well no, because in a way I'm in it, right? I'm I'm one of these five. And so that's a different way of thinking about it. And so then when I popped out to review the whole book, I'm like, oh yeah, I could do that. I could just look at that from that point of view. Mm-hmm. So uh, what I said is that Joy on Demand will give you five different paths to explore for finding joy in your own life. 
Each author shares a path that allowed them to heal from past adventures. Not every adventure was wonderful, but I find talking about trying times and difficult times as adventures allows me to more easily learn from the experience. And that's what these authors did. And it is possible to create a life filled with joy. And each of these authors shares ways for you to explore, learn, grow, and leave behind the things that weigh you down so that you can step forward into your fully joyful life. There you go. See, you know, and what did I say? And the point of me doing this this year is focusing on reviews is because it's the number one complaint I get from authors. I can't get enough reviews. And I'm like, well, have you asked, do you write reviews? And also to show our audience how easy a review is, that it doesn't take a lot of deep, turbulent thought. It doesn't have to be the great American novel. It can be something as simple as I loved this book. <laughs> so we're glad you're here with us today. So we want to know, um, are you available on social media? And if so, where can uh, the audience reach out to you? Uh, the, I think the easiest place to find me is on LinkedIn. Um, and it's a little tricky because you have to put my middle initial in there. But if you type in Laura D. Donnelly, Mm -hmm. uh, it will pop me up and then we can connect through messages or however. Mm -hmm. And I also have a channel on YouTube mm -hmm. called at ease TV. Okay. And there's a lot of videos there about different ways of, of, uh, using the concepts of body brain balance in your life and, and all of the healing path videos are there. All right. Well, that's what we want to know. And also, we want to know if you have any upcoming events, any newsletters or giveaways that we'd like to share with the audience. I do. Uh, isn't this funny? I did talk about this just recently with a group of people about consistency. And um, I think I would tell you that I am consistently joyful and fun. I am not writing the newsletter every Wednesday at 10 a.m. But I am always trying to find interesting ideas to share with people. And so if they go to my website, which is dancingwithease.com. They can uh, sign up and and get on the mailing list, and I I will send out interesting things about how to have more fun in life, how to be happier. Uh, I am not doing any particular events right now. Uh, my nose is itchy, though. This your kitty is right there and made my nose itch. Is that funny? Um, I have uh, created a free journal for people, 30 Days of Ease, which is just a very simple uh, picture and a quote to inspire thinking about how you think <laughs> <laughs> and and ways to, to kind of change it a little bit differently if you wanted to change it. Do I have anything else I'd like to include? Oh, uh, yeah. If they uh, go to dancingwithease.com, move out of pain, I have a really short video which has two tips to move out of pain right away, just instantly. That if all right. Them, they well, that's them. great. And again, we will add all of these uh, links that she mentioned in the show notes for you, along with some information about how to reach us here on the Writer's Parachute. Of course, you can reach out to us at Writer Parachute with no S on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So uh, we'll keep going on with that, but we are going to end the day with a tip of the week. So our tip of the week, Laura gave us a whole bunch of things to talk about, but one of the things that she mentioned when I talked to her before was promotion. And this becomes very difficult when you are working on an anthology, because as you said, you have five authors and then you have the person that I, I wasn't sure if the uh, fifth person was one of the authors that was putting this together or just an outside person organizing it. But again, you're at least dealing with five different people. And what happens a lot of times is you'll have some people carrying a little more of the weight than others. Some of them will be out doing interviews and promotions and getting their audience to talk about or buy and and review their book. And then you'll have others that just kind of wave, you know, ride the wave with you. So what I would suggest 
to people that are dealing with specifically an anthology or a multi-author book is to try and have a plan for promotion and marketing that should be part of your planning stage who's going to do what, how much is each person going to contribute, how much is each person expected to lift, because it can become very cumbersome. If you've got one or two authors that are, you know, just working, you know, to get the book out there, get it noticed and talked about, and then you have others that are just going, oh, well, they're doing a great job. I'll just sit back and wait. <laughs> you know, and, and so I would say in, in, even if you're only doing your own book, it's always a good idea to have some concept of how you're going to promote it. Are you just going to depend on social media? Are you going to do interviews? Are those interviews going to be on podcasts? Are they going to be radio stations? Are they going to be TV? Are you going to do news releases? Uh, you know, there's a multitude of things that you can do. Are you going to do paid promotions? You're going to do paid ads. Um, you know, where are you going to place those ads? You know, it's it's all becomes very overwhelming unless you make a plan. You know, is my plan to go on four podcasts and uh, a couple of radio stations and maybe one local TV interview? Uh, or do I want a more national stage? Do I want to do, you know, bigger podcasts? And just, you know, as we always say, it's it's always better to have a map, even if you go off on a tangent, than it is to just try to wing it, <laughs> you know, because that may end you up in the middle of the desert where there are no hotels and you're having to camp in your car. <laughs> well, and see, and what I loved about the writer's parachute is the whole image gave me this idea of, oh, yeah, I kind of jumped off the roof with an idea. <laughs> But if I got the parachute, you know, then I can kind of guide myself to a soft landing. Well, and, that's uh, ex that's exactly what we do here. We tell everybody it's okay to go jump off that cliff and build that parachute on the way down. And we've got you and we will guide you to a great landing. Uh, but I am so glad that you're here with us today. We, uh, of course, want to encourage our listeners to go follow us on YouTube and any of the podcast channels. Of course, go follow us on uh, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. <laughs> I have to remember the whole list. But we also wanted to check back with you, Laura, before you go today. Was there anything else that you wanted to tell our listeners before we go? I think that, that I was really happy with this thing I, I did, wrote, I, when I answered all your questions, is to write. Just write. If you feel like you want to write and you haven't started, just start. Start it in a silly little spiral notebook that's not even important. You know, not a fancy journal, but just something with lines on it and write and write quotes and write thoughts and write ideas and create a blog post. And a lot of times the physical act of writing helps you figure out what you're thinking about mm -hmm. in your head. We might have several ideas spinning around there, but when you, when you put them on paper, they come together in a, in a new way. They come together in a new way. And, and something about the act of writing kind of helps to clarify ideas for me. It, it um, does. It does a great job. And, I, you know, I tell people all the time, it also clears your mind for that creative process, because, again, we get back to these coulda, woulda, shitters that are circling around in your head. I need to call the dentist. Oh, don't forget to pick up salad dressing. You know, or, wait, do the tires need to be changed? When does the oil change due on the car? Did I pay the insurance? It's like I wake up and all these things are circling in my head. So if I just write them down, they're out and I can get on to being creative. So absolutely a great tip for us. Well, we thank you for being with us here today. And as always, I am so grateful to be the host for the Writer's Parachute, Guiding Author and Writer Dreams to a Perfect Landing. And we hope that you'll return and find this a creative space to land all of your dreams well. Until next time, bye.